So welcome to the second part of the Upper Limb Radiology Lecture Series. Again, my name is Dr. Paramus Paran and I'm one of the Senior Radiology Registrars with a specialist interest in musculoskeletal radiology working here at the University Hospitals of Leicester. Now we're going to start with continuing from where we left off looking at the lower forearm um, and fracture patterns that you may encounter, then focusing on the wrist, the phalanges, metacarpals, and also looking at soft tissue injury. So I'm going to start straight off by talking about two particular fracture patterns that you may see in the lower forearm, one of which is called the Montiega and the other of which is called the Galeazzi fracture pattern. Now you may encounter these um, and although they have specific uh, names, I think it's more about describing the actual fracture pattern itself. So your Montiega fracture the way you remember it is because of its ulnar shaft fracture and as a result of this ulnar shaft in addition to that you get a radial head dislocation. Um, typically you get a fall onto uh, an outstretched hand and the, you get this type of injury. Uh, it is quite rare but uh, it can you can have this displaced and overlapped appearance uh, of the ulnar shaft and the radial head is tends to be dislocated anteriorly Remember, it's the, the fracture dislocation. It's this X area here, in addition to the fracture component, that's more important than just remembering just the name or grade. Uh, in comparison, the Galeazzi fracture is a fracture of the radius as opposed to the ulna. Uh, in this case, it's more the distal radius. And as a result of that, you end up with disruption of the distal radial ulna joint. And when you have these two things and these two components, then we classically call this the Galeazzi type fracture. Again, similar mechanism of injury, fallen to an outstretched hand uh, with the elbow in flexion, uh, mainly encountered within the pediatric population, but it can be in adults, uh, accounted for about less than 7% of forearm fractures. You're more likely to get more simple fractures just through the shaft without these fracture dislocations. But again, what I'm trying to do is highlight the importance of looking for these fracture dislocations. So how do you remember these two names? Um, there is a good mnemonic that I've always learned throughout my radiology training and I hopefully this is one way of remembering it. Um, it's remembering Man United and, and Glasgow Rangers and the Montiega fracture, standing for the M, typically has an ulnar shaft fracture. The Galeazzi fracture typically has a radial shaft fracture. So once you've worked out the mnemonic stands for the type of fracture that occurs, then it's just a matter of working out which bit is dislocated. So remember your Montiega, you typically get that radial head dislocation proximally, whereas your Galeazzi fracture, you get the distal radial ulna joint that's disrupted. In this case, you can see very subtle disruption. This uh, You can see how much of angulation there is on the lateral view. So although it's not well appreciated on the AP, you can see on the lateral projection um, that volar displacement of this ulna bone. So I'm going to focus again on fracture descriptions and it's really really important to just imagine that you're describing films over the phone. I'm going to take a few minutes just to really talk through describing fractures correctly and finding a systematic way of actually describing fractures. So I think this is a good slide for uh, all of you especially at the earlier stages of your training to to remember in terms of describing fractures and if you can keep these points at the back of your head when you're verbalizing a fracture pattern on the phone then uh, you will definitely not be making any mistakes and you will sound very confident and, and as though you know what you're talking about. So in this case we've got quite a significant fracture involving not only the distal radius but also the ulna. So how would I go about describing this? Well, it's a transverse fracture of the distal radius, particularly within the metadiaphysis. Remember, you've got your growth plate, which is this lucent line in the pediatric population. You've got your epiphysis, which is this portion here, your metaphysis, and then your diaphysis. So that's just a quick recap. So in this case, it's in the metadiaphyseal region. On the lateral projection, we can see that there is dorsal displacement of the fracture fragment. Remember all of this is how it refers to proximally. So proximally, if the bone is here, this is in the dorsal portion. There's shortening of the fracture. So this 
fracture line should articulate here, which it isn't, so it's definitely shortened. There are There is also an associated fracture of the ulna, so you've got a buccal fracture here, which appears angulated. And the other, other things you've probably got to take into account is, is there any evidence of intra-articular extension of the fracture? And is it an open or closed fracture? So what you're looking for are any lucencies. Remember, it's not just about bones. Look in the soft tissues. Look for any evidence to suggest any small lacerations, any locules of air, any joint effusions, etc. Because those are the things that not everyone will comment on. And that's what makes you a good reporter and makes you a good clinician overall. So how would I describe this fracture well i think on the phone this is what i would try and say and if you can try and get to this kind of level with description it means that you're you're doing the right thing so this is a complete transverse fracture of the distal right radial metadiaphysis there is evidence of posterior lateral displacement of approximately one shaft's width shortening from about a centimeter with a dorsal and there's also mild radial angulation of this of this radial distal radius fracture there's also an associated buccal fracture of the distal ulna, particularly within the metadiaphyseal region, and it's also got an associated radial angulation. I note that there's no fracture involvement of the growth plates, there's no evidence of intra-articular extension of the fracture line, and actually the distal radial ulna joint appears to be preserved. Additionally, I note there's no evidence to suggest an open fracture. And hopefully, I know that sounds like quite a long paragraph, um, and something difficult to say over the phone, but that's predominantly what I'm using to work out what I'm saying. And although you may not see many reports that are written like this, and all you probably see is just this, there's a fracture of the distal radius, I think it's quite important to be able to describe fractures in a very systematic way uh, to sound as though you know what you're looking at and also making sure you're not missing anything important. So let's uh, move slightly further down now and focus on, on the wrist so talking through wrist anatomy i think there are different mnemonics and different ways of remembering all the bones of the wrist i will let you google out the, the different mnemonics and find the one that you like whether it be pleasant or unpleasant in terms of its mnemonic um, the way that i tend to remember it is working out what the bones are in relation to this which is bone number six bone number six is your capitate i always think of the capitate as the captain and the captain sits on the lunate, which is the boat. So if you ever see the lunate, if on the lateral view, it looks like this. So your lunate is the boat. Just above that is your capitate. So articulating with the distal radius, you've got your scaphoid, and that's this bone number one. Your lunate, your capitate, and then we'll come across this way. So here you've got your hamate. That's your hook of hamate. You've got your pisiform, and then on the ulna side, just behind the pisiform, you've got your triquetrum. So we've kind of accomplished all of these bones, and then it's just a matter of working out these two bones over here. So here you've got the base of your thumb, the bone that articulates with your thumb, and I remember this because it rhymes, is your trapezium. So that's number four, and then that leaves the last bone, which uh, actually doesn't tend to get injured too much, and that's your trapezoid. So your trapezium, your trapezoid. So just to go through that systematically, remember your capitate. Capitate sits on the boat, which is your lunate. Radius articulates with the scaphoid, which is number one. You've got your pisiform and your triquetrum. You've got your hamate with its hook. And then you've got your trapezium articulating with the base of the thumb and your trapezoid, your trapezoid. So that's your carpal bones. And then in terms of nomenclature naming these metacarpals so that's the base of your first the base of your second third fourth fifth metacarpals and of course you've got your radius or your distal radius in this case your radial styloid process you also have an ulnar styloid process distal ulnar you've got your distal radial ulnar joint here you have cartilage we have something called the triangle fiber cartilage which is why you tend to get this space and then remember, you've got uh, quite a broad, various amount of ligaments that, that will come and attach to all these different portions. Classically, on your volar aspect, you have the carpal tunnel, and through that runs all these multitude of ligaments. Uh, quite important, especially in carpal tunnel syndrome, where you get compression of that median nerve, which runs through this carpal tunnel, predominantly within your proximal and your distal carpal rows. Uh, 
So one of the one of the ways to look for alignment on your lateral is to look for the capitate, which is this structure here sitting on the saucer. Uh, sorry, on the teacup, which then sits on the saucer, which is your uh, distal radius. So your distal radius is saucer. You've got your lunate, which is the teacup, and then you've got the egg within the teacup, which is your capitate. That's one way of remembering it. Uh, on your volar aspect, you have the scaphoid. So that's this bony projection here. And then remember, you've got your trapezium, trapezoid. The, the lateral projection can be quite difficult if you can't remember all the different bones. So try and orientate yourself with the AP projection first and then try and work out where things are on the lateral projection. But again, remember the importance of two Vs. So that's some basic anatomy covered. And then we'll come across probably the two main fractures that you, you'll see in the elderly population, which is your Collies and your, and your Smith fractures. And all this really is, I mean, apart from the, the naming culture that we've used, it's really just whether there's dorsal or volar angulation of that distal radius fracture. So here, if we were to describe this, this is a distal radius fracture, which on the AP view, you can't tell whether it's dorsal or volarly angulated. We have a look on the lateral. We can see that this is the dorsal aspect of the wrist. This is the volar aspect of the wrist. So there is dorsal angulation and there is impaction, which we can appreciate on the AP view. Quite importantly, there is no evidence of intra-articular extension. And that's a common, important finding of calling this a Collies fracture. So distal radius fracture with dorsal angulation, we call a Collies fracture. Just remember this image. Now, in the contrary, you've got a distal radius fracture with volar angulation. Um, and again, remember, this is all extra articular, so there's no evidence of intra articular extension. We commonly call this a Smith's fracture. So, in this case, remember the way that we name these dislocations so that it's all in relation to this proximal segment. So, here we've got the radius and ulna, and all of this is in the volar position there's volar angulation and therefore this is therefore made uh, as a smith's fracture it looks a lot more complex on this projection again comminuted it looks impacted uh, sometimes you refer to this as a reverse collies and it counts for about 89 to 90 percent of these types of fractures but you're more commonly likely to get uh, a collies fracture so there are other eponymous names of fractures. Uh, again, it's beyond the remit of this lecture, but the other things to consider would be Bartons and reverse Bartons fractures, all again relating to the distal radius and the type of fracture pattern that you're getting. So we're moving a bit further in, and uh, what we've got to look at now is, is there the extent of, uh, is there more than just a fracture on this radiograph? So just pause for a second, have a look at this radiograph and try and work out if there's just a fracture or is there something else that we need to comment on. And so what we see here is an intra-articular, in this case radial styloid fracture. You can see the fracture line definitely extending to the articular margin. Uh, it appears quite comminuted. On the AP projection, you can see that going through the radial styloid, which is this pro process, but what is it that's quite important about this fracture? Well, actually, it's this. It's this distance here. This is what we call a scapholunate dissociation. And this is quite important to, to be able to, to call. This is uh, Terry Thomas, who's um, famously, uh, this, this scapholunate dissociation is famously named after him because of his two teeth. Um, but essentially, this can't be missed um, on radiographs, and it's quite important that it is commented on because this is suggestive of significant injury to the scapholunate ligament. And if it's greater than four millimeters, in this case, it definitely looks like it is, then there is more evidence to suggest that there will be disruption of the capitate as it migrates proximally. And eventually you will end up with quite significant osteoarthrosis uh, and osteoarthritis of this region here. And the patient will be in significant pain. So this is all related to ligamentous disruption. So it's not just the fracture. So we shouldn't just cast this. We need to do something more than just casting this patient. The, the actual ligament should be repaired. 
again another example of something that's more than just a, a simple fracture so here we we have a look at the AP radiograph and yes there is just a, an ulnar styloid process fracture but I wouldn't be giving you something as simple as that uh, the radius looks okay nothing at the bases so we'll start tracing out these bones the ray the scaphoid looks okay trapezium trapezoid looks okay capitate looks a bit odd it should be articulate with with the lunate which we can't actually see in a boat shape and actually what we're seeing is a triangular appearance to the lunate where you look at it on the lateral and this lunate has flipped out and this is the classical example of a lunate dislocation so this represents quite significant carpal injury uh, classically you get this triangular pattern we call it the pi sign so there's two things that you can call once you see uh, this triangular pattern it's either going to be what we call a lunate dislocation which is demonstrated in this example or it could be a perilunate dislocation again beyond the remit of this lecture but that's something to be aware about and this again indicates quite significant disruption of the proximal carpal row and something needs to be done about this so look for that lunate see if it's flipped across and if so that's a lunate dislocation uh, diagrammatically this is what we're looking for we should see a normal articulation this lunate should be that saucer the teacup which we don't see because the teacup is flipped and then the egg which is still present which is that capitate and this is the classical pie shape that you see so moving on we'll focus on scaphoid fractures now scaphoid views generally tend to be more than just one projection um, classically your scaphoid views are of about four to five projections and the reason for that is you just don't want to miss scaphoid fractures if you miss them the blood supply is distal to proximal and as a result of missing them you may end up actually missing a, an avascular necrosis of the proximal pole and that's essentially bone dying proximally so here we've got different examples of or one example of a scaphoid fracture on different views um, and of course on one of the views you can quite clearly see it but if you appreciate on the on the remaining views it's actually quite a difficult thing to spot and that's why you need to have more than one projection. There are other ways of, of imaging this. You can, of course, do uh, CTs. And nowadays, there's cone beam CTs, which has slightly lower dose. But in, in the initial instance, it's important to look for these scaphoid fractures uh, and be able to classify them. Now, here you can see very subtle early sclerosis of this proximal pole. And this is what we need to be looking out for, because this could represent early AVN or avascular necrosis. Um, what I mean by that is if we have a look at the CT, this is the same patient. You can see the normal architecture of the bone with the lucency throughout. And you can see how the, the remaining bone matrix looks like. But when you look at that proximal pole, there's this very subtle sclerosis. And this is early avascular necrosis. Here we've got an example of a more severe case. This, these are MRI sequences. So we've got um, a T1 weighted sequence, which is essentially looking at bone marrow and uh, looking uh, at edema and we've got uh, t a stir weighted sequence which is a fluid sensitive sequence looking at the extent of bone marrow edema um, and how florid things could look so here you can see this high signal within the proximal pole of the scaphoid which has corresponding low signal on the t1 and this is all in keeping with avascular necrosis of the proximal pole you can see how much smaller this actually looks and how much bone edema there is still this high signal within the capitate and the lunate as a result of the impaction and the sclerosis that's forming within this avascular necrosis. So why is it that this occurs? Well, it's important to note that the distal, the blood supply occurs distal to proximal, and there's only one or two vessels that actually traverse down. So once you fracture across the waist or the proximal pole, then actually you're limiting your blood supply to this proximal aspect. And subsequent to that, you end up with this sclerotic appearance, which is classically bone that doesn't have blood supply and therefore dying so it's really really important to pick these up early and uh, if required the p the patient will need to have uh, surgery to make sure that that there is no loss of uh, blood supply to the proximal aspect of the bone so let's move on to some more specific fractures this is one of my favorite this is the triquetral fracture and I, I really like this fracture only because it's the only fracture that you can see on the lateral view. Um, so you tend to see this small fracture fragment on the dorsal aspect. Um, when you look at it on the AP projection, 
you don't really see much because this is the the position of the triquetrum. On the dorsal aspect, you, t you get this tiny fracture fragment, and this is in keeping with a triquetral fracture. So the moment you see this, this is pathognomonic, and it's just a triquetral fracture. That's all you need to say. Um, there is it's the second most uh, carpal bone fracture, followed uh, just after from the scaphoid fracture. And actually, this is a good way of remembering it. If you remember, it's called the, the pooping duck sign, where if you've got the scaphoid, you've got the lunate, which is the nest, the scaphoid, which is the, the bird, and then you see this little fracture fragment. This is the, the bit of poop, which is essentially your, your triquetral fracture. So uh, let's move on to dislocations. Now we're moving into the hand. Um, one of the important dislocations, and I'm going to highlight just a few cases of the, of the things that I think you shouldn't miss ever, uh, is actually a fifth metacarpal dislocation. So here we have a look at your AP and your lateral projection. Uh, you can immediately see that there is significant malalignment of that fifth metacarpal. Uh, and th there should be some overlap. If you have a look at the normal radiograph, this is how it should look, articulating quite nicely with the, the hook of the hamate. In this case, it's dislocated. If we have a look at the metacarpals, all of these metacarpals should align up with the exception of the first metacarpal. But here we can see that fifth metacarpal has jumped forward. And this is your classical metacarpal dislocation. Really interrogate the AP and lateral radiographs and really look for any evidence of incongruity that it doesn't look normal from what you should be expecting to see. So in this case, no fracture is seen, but you do have uh, a dislocation. So I'll show you a few examples of some metacarpal and phalanges fracture. Um, this is the base of the first metacarpal. Um, and you have a, a ligament called the abductor pollicis longus ligament, which causes abduction of your thumb. If there's any hyperabduction or forced abduction, this first metacarpal will, the base is where it attaches and that tends to evolve off. And this is what we call a Bennett's fracture. If it becomes more comminuted, then it's a Rolando's fracture. And that's, these are two fractures. So I haven't showed you a Rolando's, but this Bennett's fracture here is, is an important fracture to recognize because it does require urgent surgery. Here we've got a fifth metacarpal fracture, commonly known as, or the metacarpal neck fracture, commonly known as the boxer's fracture. Um, so boxer's fractures are minimally comminuted, but they're classically transverse fractures through the metacarpal neck. And they're probably one of the most common types of metacarpal fractures. So it's typically because of a direct blow with a clenched fist against a solid surface, gives you this axial loading onto the fifth metacarpal Generally, it tends to be walls or human faces, and young adult males are by far the most commonly affected group, about 95%. But of course, it can occur in anyone that wants to throw a punch. So that's your boxes fracture. This is your Bennett's fracture. And then these are fractures of the second, the third, the fourth metacarpals, particularly at the bases. You can see that second oblique fracture is quite significant but remember it may not just be one fracture there may be other fractures involved in this case we've got the base of the third the base of the fourth metacarpal is also involved and you can see that how much angulation and displacement there is on the on the lateral oblique view that we've got here so that comes uh, and puts an end to the types of fractures that we've got throughout the upper limb i'm just going to focus on the final slide just talking about soft tissue abnormalities Again, reminding you of, of the importance of two views uh, and also the importance of densities. So some of the things you may be asked to look at is the is there any evidence of foreign bodies? Now in this case, we've got a nail through what looks like the third metacarpal uh, near its, so not the metacarpal, the third proximal phalanx near its neck. Um, and what we've got to ascertain is, is this going through the bone? Or is this going lateral to the bone? Now, the easiest way, of course, is to get your lateral view and then you can immediately see the importance of two views. But foreign bodies tend to be, if they're metallic, tend to be very radiodense. So it's quite easy and they're quite straightforward. Um, remember, other soft tissue abnormalities would be looking at the soft tissue of the hand to see if there's any ex evidence of hematoma or soft tissue swelling. It's not just purely about the bones. And I keep um, re reminding you that 
once you've assessed the bones, always, always look at the soft tissues. Um, here we've got an example where there's actually no fracture that's demonstrated. This is your lateral elbow. But you can see this very subtle, rounded, well-defined lucency within the, the soft tissues of the forearm. There's an associated soft tissue swelling. Uh, here we've got a classical, if you remember from the part one lecture, you've got no anterior humeral line or fat pad sign. So there's no evidence to suggest a fracture as such, but there is this soft tissue lucency. This actually is in keeping with uh, lipoma. Uh, again, you wouldn't know that from the radiograph, but in terms of management, managing this patient, uh, just remember this patient will need further imaging. If there is any evidence of trauma, just think of collections, think of hematomas, if there is no specific evidence of an underlying fracture. I hope that this lecture has been of uh, use, uh, both part one and part two. Um, we've covered in a systematic approach uh, from the clavicle all the way down to the to the fingers in terms of fractures and trauma that can occur and particularly how they may present on radiographs. We've also covered the importance of soft tissue abnormalities and also a systematic approach at describing fractures. And this was particularly highlighted at the start of the part two lecture uh, and the use of a, a systematic description in describing uh, fracture patterns and also remembering it's not just fractures but remembering dislocations any uh, open or closed injury uh, and uh, describing if there's any particular subluxation or dislocation or angulation that needs to be mentioned um, so I hope that this has provided you with a guide and, and a good introduction to looking at upper limb pathology and uh, I wish you the best of luck in your rotation thank you